fast Swedish one-tonner off the coast of southern Florida. The wind was out of the southeast at about 20 knots, and there was a good sea running. It was an exhilarating experience. Everything about it was good. That was on Sunday. Monday morning, as I write these words, I'm just as excited, just as exhilarated as I was yesterday. I went sailing with a friend yesterday in a fast Swedish one-tonner off the coast of southern Florida. The wind was out of the southeast at I went sailing with a friend yesterday in a fast Swedish one-tonner off the coast of southern Florida. The wind was out of the southeast at about 20 knots, and there was a good sea running. It was an exhilarating experience. Everything about it was good. That was on Sunday. Monday morning, as I write these words, I'm just as excited, just as exhilarated as I was yesterday, but for some completely different reasons. Today I'm working on a project I'm trying to put together, an interesting business enterprise. Now, if anything, it's more exciting than sailing. Sailing is my hobby, and I'll never give it up until I have to, but I've learned that I'm happiest, living the fullest, obviously doing what I was meant to do when I'm making plans for the growth of our organization. And it's good to know that sort of thing about yourself. It means knowing what it takes to turn yourself on, to keep yourself living fully extended, right up to the very limits of whatever it is you happen to have to offer. And that's why you can't come up with pet answers for people. The person with whom I went sailing yesterday would have no interest at all in doing what I'm doing today, and I'd be bored stiff doing what he's doing today. The important thing seems to be to find out what it is that makes me excited. There's still time to enjoy sailing or golf or tennis or skiing or flying or whatever happens to interest you as a hobby. An oil magnet friend of mine finds his fun and relaxation playing backgammon. For another person, it's taking the family camping. All good, all fine. But what about when the fun is over, when you come back home and all of a sudden it's Monday morning and the alarm clock is ringing? Now there's the moment of truth for every human being in our society. Now I'm not saying that the transition from deep comfortable sleep to the waking state on a Monday morning is going to be a time for celebration. That is a relatively difficult time for any living creature. But after the coffee and the shower comes the moment of truth. What then? Is it interesting? Is it a challenge to the mind and talents? Well, I think it's great when it is, but I don't think it is for most people. I don't think it can be that way all the time for any person. There are times when we're between excitements, when the old excitement is run down and the new one hasn't been fashioned yet. But fashioning excitements is, or seems to be, the one thing a human being can do which keeps things lively and interesting. Sometimes I think I could be perfectly happy for the rest of my life if I could just sail the world forever, sailing from one place to another, the South Pacific, the Western Pacific, New Zealand... Australia, the Indian Ocean, Africa, Europe, on and on, waking each morning to the sea and the air, looking forward to the next port, and after staying in it a while, looking for the sea again. But I know it wouldn't work that way. After the sea for a while, we long for the land. After too many crowds, we long for solitude. After solitude, we want people. There's a charter boat skipper in the United States Virgin Islands who will tell you as you sit over drinks in the evening that as soon as he can get enough money together, he's going to sell his boat and go back to the farm where he intends to spend the rest of his life. Now, there must be millions of men who would imagine that chartering your own sailboat in the Virgin Islands, sailing from one lovely tropical island to another, living on the blue sea in ideal weather year after year, would be about as close to heaven as a human being can make it and still keep vertical with both feet on Mother Earth. But the man with the boat wants the farm. He wants the farm now. After he's back on the farm for a few months or a year or so, he's going to wonder why he sold that sailboat and left the Virgin Island. He's still in the drifting and looking state, as are millions, looking for the ideal, for utopia. He hasn't found what turns him on and gets him excited, even on a Monday morning. He dreams of an ideal farm, and there isn't such a thing. While perhaps some farmer dreams of sailing the blue waters of the Virgins and the Grenadines. Both are missing the fun and opportunity of the present, while they dream of a vague future for which they are neither qualified nor likely to enjoy for long. The farmer should be enjoying the farm, and the charter boat skipper should be enjoying the Virgin Islands, and the chances are neither one of them is really applying his imagination to what he's doing. Each of them is missing out on the joy of what he's got while he waits for something that may never happen, and they belong to a big club. Sometime back in the Hillsdale College leadership letter, a good section of it was devoted to the seven marks of a good man. I found them interesting. Here's the chance for a wife to see how her husband does and a man to quickly assess himself. The seven marks of a good man. 
Number one, a good man has worthy goals. As Seneca put it, when a man doesn't know what harbor he's making for, no wind is the right wind. Goals are vital, and as Donald Laird has pointed out, the greatest airline or railroad is still to be operated, the greatest automobile is still to be designed, the greatest scientific discoveries are still to be made. The greatest of everything is still in the future. So there are plenty of worthy goals to shoot for, in addition to personal goals. A good man has worthy goals. Two, the good man believes that certain values are important. He has values and upholds them. They give order and balance and meaning to his life. And he makes adjustments to life's problems in terms of his values. They are to him a checklist of priorities against which he weighs his decisions. Three, the good man has a satisfying self-image. It's one of relative security, confidence, encouragement, and contentment. An image of self-approval is a healthy thing. Approval by others is important, but in the last analysis, it matters less than self-approval. Four, the good man has inner resources. He has the courage to stand for his convictions. He's more concerned about being right than about personal achievement, advancement, or social popularity. He has no price. He will not sell out. As Roger Babson put it, there is a greater demand for people of character today than at any time in history. Industry, intelligence, imagination, and persistence are great gold mines, and it's still true. Five, the good man works productively. All work and no play is not good. Our bodies and our minds need rest, relaxation, and recreation. Some leisure time is needed by everyone. But work is also essential. It makes an outstanding contribution to good health, both physical and mental. The opportunity to work is a privilege. The ability to work is priceless. Six, the good man serves willingly. If he's at all smart, he knows that his rewards can only be in proportion to his service. But it goes deeper than that. It's like that of the boy who gave blood to save the life of a 12-year-old girl with leukemia. She needed a transfusion, but her rare type of blood made it difficult to locate a donor. Finally, a boy was found who had the same type. And though badly frightened at the prospect, he agreed to give his blood. At the hospital, he stretched out on the table, shut his eyes, and set his teeth, but said nothing. A nurse, concerned by his pale face and frightened appearance, said to him, Johnny, are you all right? Yes, was the reply, but... Well, but what? asked the nurse. When do I die? responded the boy. For a moment, the nurse was perplexed. Then she said, You mean that you thought you would have to die to save this little girl? Yes, was the response. And number seven, the good man enjoys the success of others. Being successful himself... He enjoys seeing others successful and succeed and helps them where he can. Well, how did you do on the list of the seven marks of a good human being? Probably a lot better than you at first imagined. I had lunch the other day with a vice president and international sales director of a large, well-known American company. As usual, we got on the subject of communications, and he told me an interesting story. For years... He's been sending a weekly letter to every man in his company's 300-man sales force. Not long ago, he fell to wondering how many of the men actually read this weekly letter. So in the third paragraph of one of the letters, he included this statement. If you will initial this letter and return it to me, I'll send you $5. It cost his company 25 bucks. Five out of the 300 were reading the letters. Well, it so happens that the weekly letters and the weekly paychecks to the men are mailed on the same day, but in different envelopes. The pay envelope is a different size and color. So one week, they put the paychecks in the envelopes with the weekly letter. The following Monday morning, there was a company-wide crisis. The switchboard was jammed with calls from the stalwarts of the sales force complaining that they had not received their paychecks. When they were told that the checks had been put in the envelope with the weekly letter, there was nothing but unbroken silence on the line as the men tried to remember where they had thrown away the company newsletter. So much for the effectiveness of in-company communications. In my opinion, there were three mistakes made. One, the letters were undoubtedly poorly and uninterestingly written, the kindest thing a person can do with most in-company letters, house organs, bulletins, and so forth, is quietly drop them into the wastebasket. Often as not, the job of writing these letters is given to a person amazingly unqualified to handle them. If you want someone to read your letters, you have to earn his attention and loyalty by making the letters really interesting, with meat and excitement and maybe some good humor in them. Each letter, when it arrives, should be looked forward to with genuine interest. Now, this means that the person in charge of this important job must be qualified and talented. Unless the people are somehow changed and improved by your in-company communications, save your money and stop it. So much for reason number one. Two, 
An unbroken weekly barrage of almost anything tends to become tiresome. Find some way of changing what you're doing in this area. Make it bigger one week or smaller or a different color or a different form or with different and interesting pictures. Find some way to fight monotony. And three, printed communications are never as effective as audio communications. Most people don't like to read. In fact, most people still read at about the sixth grade level, about two to three hundred words a minute. This doesn't mean they stop their education at the sixth grade. It just means that when we master anything, we tend to leave it right there. We seldom try to improve. Records or tapes are much more effective and will be heard by the entire family. By sharing Dad's company communications, members of the family are drawn more closely together behind him, his problems, goals, and so on. And in this form, again, provided they're interesting and genuinely helpful, the communication will be listened to more than once. Good in-company communications are extremely important. In fact, communications today is the name of the game. And good in-company communications will improve production, sales, morale, and profits. Here's something interesting written by Dorothy Van Doren. She reminds us that when someone asked St. Francis while he was working in his garden what he would do if he were suddenly to learn that he would die at sunset that day, he replied, I would finish hoeing my garden. That line, she writes, seems to me an answer to all the troubled young people these days who are beginning life in a world that appears to hold no security for them or for anyone young or old. Why should they bother to go to college when the atom war may be just around the corner? Why should a young wife have a baby when the ceiling may collapse on its crib? Why should one paint a picture or write a song or begin a novel? We can't be sure of anything, these young people say, not now or next year or the year after that. Why should we try to make a life for ourselves, they ask. Why should we go to classes or take examinations or get married or look for an apartment or try for a job? Next spring or some spring too frighteningly near, it may all go, the life we've all begun. Our world is in deadly peril. We've lost the promise of tomorrow. Well, St. Francis put the answer in a simple metaphor. Go on hoeing your garden. The task is still there, the house to build, the book to write, the examination to prepare for. If the future looks dark, so did it in every age of the past. And however dark it seems today, however dark it is, we'll meet life better if we fulfill the present to the best of our ability. Today is still ours, along with the obligation to live it to the full. As St. Francis said, we must go on hoeing our garden. What makes that kind of thinking important is that the tomorrow that may never come has a way of coming around anyway. We naturally admire and respect the kind of people who can continue on with what needs to be done in the face of crisis and those who take a calm look at life and the future. It's like the story of the very old man who was planting a small tree in his garden. The neighbor called over to him and said, What are you planting that tree for, old man? You'll never live to see it grow up. The old man replied, You've got to plan on living forever or dying tomorrow. There's something about getting into the swim of things that puts a new face on living. You can wake up in the morning feeling beat and depressed, wondering what's the use and toying with the idea of just lying there forever. But by forcing yourself out of bed and into the shower and turning to what needs to be done, your attitude begins to change and improve. And before long, well, it all seems worthwhile again. Activity. Beginning to do whatever needs to be done, even if you have to force yourself to get started, is the answer to the problems that face us. As someone wrote, do your work. Not just your work and no more, but a little more for the lavishing's sake. That little more that's worth all the rest. And if you doubt as you must, and if you suffer as you must, do your work. Put your heart into it, and the sky will clear. And then from your very doubt and suffering will be born the supreme joy of life. You might want to remember the story about St. Francis and his comment that even if he were to discover that his life would be over at sunset, he'd finish hoeing his garden. Only by sweating freely and breathing hard will you be able to help protect your heart against our number one killer, coronary heart disease. So says Bud Wilkinson in his excellent book, Bud Wilkinson's Guide to Modern Physical Fitness. A President's Commission on Coronary Heart Disease came up with some stunning statistics that diseases of the heart and bloodstream now account for 54.8% of the deaths in the United States from all causes. As many people die of coronaries in this country every year as the total of the people who die from the five next most important causes, cancer, accidents, pneumonia, and influenza, diabetes, and certain diseases of childhood. Every minute, every hour, every day, someone dies of a coronary in the United States. In 1900, only 20% of the deaths in this country were due to diseases of the heart and blood system. Why has the figure grown to 54.8% in the last few decades? 
The American Medical Association says that there are growing indications that the threat may be a, quote, disease of prosperity, end of quote. I agree with both statements completely, says Bud Wilkinson. In a very real sense, we're giving ourselves coronaries. We're doing it by trying to create a society that takes the sweat and strain out of living, and we are succeeding to an alarming degree. With any luck, you can go for weeks at a time without drawing a deep breath or raising your pulse rate a beat a minute. You learn to avoid stairs as though they were minefields. You trim your lawn with a power mower that can be converted in the winter to blow snow off your sidewalk. If you're a real status seeker, you have a power mower you can ride. If the hedge needs clipping, you can get an electric appliance to do the job. The examples go on and on endlessly. Electric knives, electric shoe shiners, toothbrushes, even electric cocktail shakers. Sweat is disappearing so rapidly in the United States that the multi-million dollar deodorant industry may be getting uneasy. Everything has been automated except the human body itself, and there's the rub. We still have bodies that need to be used. We have bodies that have evolved during the centuries of man's presence on Earth into magnificent machines for survival. Putting the matter very simply, the human body is not designed for indolence. It's designed to sweat. The more it labors, the better it gets. In time, say a few hundred thousand years, the forces of natural selection may modify the body so that it's suited for leisure, but for now, we're stuck with the old-fashioned model. We're walking around in warriors' bodies. We're equipped to march with Caesar, but there's no place to go but the corner drugstore, and we drive there. Your heart is a pump made of muscle. When it doesn't have enough work to do, it gets softer and less efficient, just as your biceps get soft when you have no loads to lift. The loafer's heart as it's been called, cannot move as much blood with a single beat as a well-conditioned heart. The more active you are, the less likely a heart attack. Exercise can often reduce the levels of several key factors, high level of blood fats, overweight, high blood pressure, and emotional tension. And here are nine rules for success that I like. See what you think of. One, never lose your capacity for enthusiasm. When that's gone, nothing else matters. Two, never lose your capacity for indignation. Three, don't judge people or type them too quickly. Never assume that a person is bad. Assume that at best he's good, and at worst he belongs in that gray area between good and bad. Four, never be impressed by wealth alone or thrown by poverty. The rules for great wealth do not necessarily include becoming a well-rounded, interesting, or even intelligent person. While you will frequently find all these qualities in a wealthy person, the only absolute rules for great wealth are A, Make wealth your major goal in life, and B, persist undeviatingly until the goal is reached. As for poverty, there's not a family on earth whose ancestors did not at one time live in poverty. Poverty today does not necessarily indicate poverty tomorrow. Five, if you can't be generous when it's hard, you won't be able to be generous when it's easy. Six, the greatest builder of confidence is the ability to do something, almost anything well. Seven, when that confidence comes... Strive for humility. Eight, the way to become truly useful is to seek the best that other brains have to offer. What one person can think of, another person can build. Use the brains of others to supplement your own, or you're very probably not going to make it. And then be prepared to give credit when credit is due. As long as no one cares who gets the credit, opportunity is always present. And nine, the greatest tragedies in the world, and in personal events, stem from misunderstanding? The answer, communicate. I play golf occasionally with a great person who controls a vast worldwide industrial empire. He told me about a time when working for a large government contract, a government negotiator said something that indicated that my friend was a crook. He was so enraged by the comment that he turned white as a ghost and sat very quiet for a long time before he could get himself under control. Later that night in his hotel room, he received a telephone call from the man who had insulted him. The government man said, I noticed you seem to get very angry at something I said today, and it's been bothering me ever since. What did I say that rubbed you the wrong way? Well, when my friend told him, he was amazed. I didn't mean that the way you took it, he said, and went on to explain. It was simply a matter of crossed communications. And this happens often with all of us, with our families and our business associates. If we'll just keep cool... Swallow the angry words and wait a while. The matter will usually clear up. Anyway, nine rules for success. Never lose your enthusiasm. Never lose your capacity for indignation. Don't judge people or type them too quickly. Never be impressed by wealth alone or thrown by poverty. 
If you can't be generous when it's hard, you won't be when it's easy. The greatest builder of confidence is the ability to do something, anything well. When confidence comes, strive for humility. Use the brains of others and give credit when you do, and communicate. How did you score? And incidentally, have you checked your AQ lately? I ran across a most interesting article in Pace Magazine some time back devoted to the AQ, which stands for Aspiration Quotient. In short, how are your aspirations? You don't have to concern yourself with this if you're, one, dreaming the possible dream, two, fighting the beatable foe, or three, running for mayor of New York City. Your reach should always exceed your present grasp or you've stopped growing. As Jacqueline Grennan put it, one has to have the kind of security to be insecure if one wants to gamble for the great end. And as John Ciardi once put it, an ulcer gentleman is an unkissed imagination taking its revenge for having been jilted. We find ourselves with a perfectly natural and wonderful daydream that keeps coming back to haunt our idle moments. And instead of going after that daydream, we keep pushing it back until it turns into an ulcer to punish us. Hell hath no fury like an aspiration scorned too long. The test of an aspiration is to ask yourself, is it a worthy thing I'm dreaming of doing or having? Is it good? Will I hurt anyone by bringing this beautiful idea from its dream state into a state of reality? If not, then charge. Fulfill that aspiration and let yourself relax for a while until a new aspiration begins to tug at the coattails of your mind. This is the way to keep things interesting, to make waves, to fight boredom and ennui. If you're without aspirations of any kind, you're probably one of the following. One, a holy man. Two, enormously rich. Three, a well-adjusted person. Or four, you're in a rut. Or perhaps you're one of those unfortunate persons who doesn't know that the ground that lies between you and your aspiration can usually be crossed. The trouble with most people when it comes to sprinting for an aspiration seems to lie in their reluctance to haul themselves up out of the old, well-worn groove and take off across new exposed ground. But as the old saw has it, you can't very well get to second base and still keep one foot on first. You need the kind of security, inner security, to risk insecurity. If you lack that, well, then I guess you've got to settle for the status quo. But whatever your reactions happen to be, it's good to check one's aspirations from time to time, haul out the old want list, and see how many items you can check off since the last time you looked at it or if you still want the same things. You've got to be careful. The years tend to do the same thing to our habits that they do to a piece of exposed machinery, which is to rust and fuse them until what were once moving parts don't move anymore. We tend to settle for minimums, except for occasional flashes of bigger and better aspirations, which don't last and which therefore go unrealized. We tend to play it ridiculously safe. Sometimes you get the feeling that people think they're going to live forever. So how's your AQ, your... Aspiration quotient. Remember what John Giardi said. An ulcer, gentlemen, is an unkissed imagination taking its revenge for having been jilted. We don't want that to happen, do we? It was reported in the magazine Office Administration that despite all the literature that's been written about motivating employees, there still remain only two basic things which you can do to spur better performance to make a worker a willing worker. One, you can allow your people to tackle as much and more than they can handle. Most people don't really begin to click until they're under some pressure. Good ideas, a better way to do things, are not the result of a mind working at half speed. Further, people are happier with a full workload. They have more to be happy about, and the day flies by. Two, employees must be given the freedom to make mistakes. A subordinate can win some and lose some. If a wild idea hits the mark, alter the good. If it's a bomb, it's important for you to be solidly behind him. A good manager constantly asks himself this question about each employee. What can I do to make it easier for him to work harder? I agree that those two points are important, but I don't agree that they're the only factors involved in helping workers to be willing and conscientious workers. Incidentally, Jacob Jacoby reported in Personnel Journal that the old theory that work music improves employee morale and consequently productivity has little evidence to support it. Recent studies show employees most certainly do enjoy the music, but there is not much to indicate that this enjoyment results in greater productivity. Music, according to a survey of those who listen to it, is more likely to affect quality of work than quantity. 
Thus, like other morale factors, it may contribute indirectly to productivity by reducing absenteeism, for example. It might also result in less employee turnover. I think music is an excellent idea, if for no other reason that the employees like it. Music makes work more pleasant, and I think it tends to reduce tensions, which can result in poor customer relations and bickering among employees. I have no documentary evidence to support this theory. It's just a personal opinion. But getting back to the two main points made earlier, it's true that people don't really begin to click until they're under some pressure. That's the right kind of pressure, the kind that brings out the best in them, not the kind that causes worry or fear. Just come up with a big job to be done and watch how people pitch in and how they enjoy it. We all do. People love to work when the work is recognized, and they're recognized for doing it. And when an employee makes a mistake, and it's an honest mistake, he should get encouragement rather than criticism. People who don't make mistakes aren't trying enough. They're not innovating enough. There are some jobs where you don't want this, like packing parachutes or working on precision parts, but for most jobs, a mistake now and then is a healthy sign. Two main points in helping people be happier on the job. One, allow them to tackle as much as they can handle. People are happiest when they're busiest. And two, give them freedom to make mistakes. You know, visionaries see a day in the future when man will no longer work at all. If that day ever comes, I believe we will have had it. As the Christophers pointed out in one of their excellent little news notes, man is meant to work. Because of his very nature, each person must find a creative, constructive outlet for his talents and energies. The great artist Leonardo da Vinci put it well when he said, Iron rusts from disuse, stagnant water loses its purity, and in cold weather becomes frozen. Even so does inaction sap the vigors of the mind. We need work with a purpose. To dig holes just to fill them up again is frustrating, but to work toward a goal for others is meaningful. Nothing enriches a person as does work well done, yet people will go to any lengths to avoid the very work that would give meaning to their lives. When Queen Victoria complimented the celebrated pianist Paderewski, she said, Mr. Paderewski, you are a genius, and he replied, Perhaps, Your Majesty, but before I was a genius, I was a drudge. The same thought was echoed by Michelangelo when he said, If people knew how hard I have had to work to gain my mastery, it wouldn't seem wonderful at all. The great inventions of Thomas Edison were the fruit of long, painstaking effort. He said genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. He also said, I never did anything worth doing by accident, nor did any of my inventions come by accident. They came by work. Work is actually a remedy. A century ago, Thomas Carlyle said work is the grand cure for all the maladies that ever beset mankind. Honest work, which you intend getting done. A survey of, in London of typists who frequently changed jobs found that they became bored and dissatisfied because they did not have enough work to do. A woman will complain about how overworked she is and enjoy every minute of it. In fact, she'll quit if she doesn't have enough work to do. And the kindest thing parents can do for their children is to teach them to work while they're still young. It's been found that the kids who have definite chores to do around the house, no matter how loud they complain, grow up to be more successful, more productive people. They also make better wives, husbands, and parents. It's important for a youngster to know that work is a part of living and to get the fun and joy that comes from doing a job well. Thomas Jefferson said, Do all you can to help boys and girls discover the joy of work. It's while we're young that the habit of industry is formed. If not then, it never is afterwards. The fortune of our lives, therefore, depends on employing well the short period of our youth. You will hear adults say, Let them play. There will be plenty of work to do after they're grown. Well, it doesn't work that way. They can still have plenty of time for play and learn to help out a little around the house, too, or hold down a summer job. We don't always like the idea of going to work, but we'd be miserable without it. General Doolittle once said that the prime reason that nations and cultures have died is that the people have become soft and lazy. They've quit work when they've reached the top of the heap. They've endeavored to rest on their laurels. I heard something interesting the other day at lunch. It seems that a friend of a friend of mine has a very shrewish wife. For many years, he had led a dog's life because of her constant badgering. He would no sooner get home in the evening, but she'd find work for him to do. On the occasion of a recent physical examination, his doctor told him he looked run down and appeared to be suffering from a mild case of exhaustion, depression, and so on. The man explained that his wife was running him ragged. The doctor thought a moment and then asked the man if he'd mind if he had a chat with his wife. The man said, no, of course not. The doctor called the man's wife and told her that, in his opinion, her husband was headed straight for a heart attack. 
and that unless something changed radically, she was going to be a widow in the not-too-distant future. Well, the change at home was immediate and immensely gratifying. The woman obviously saw her husband in a completely new light. Here was the man she loved, or at the very least, here was the man who was bringing home a reliable, negotiable paycheck every week, which made the mortgage payment, bought all kinds of groceries, cars, clothes and things, suddenly threatened with extinction. Now when he comes home at night, it's as though he's an honored guest. He's treated as though his pockets are stuffed with vials of nitroglycerin, and all is well again in his household. Well, one of the fellows at lunch commented that this was possibly the creative idea of the year. He was going to get his doctor to call his wife and tell her the same story. Someone else said that this is an excellent way to find out what your wife really thinks of you. If she jumps out from behind doors shouting boo, or gives you heavy loads to carry upstairs to the attic, you can come to one conclusion, whereas if she treats you with sudden loving kindness, you can come to another. So it started an interesting conversation, and finally the point was made that if any of us knew that the days of a loved one were numbered, we would treat that person with more love and consideration. The point was then made that we do know that the days of our loved ones are numbered. We just don't know what the number is. So it might be a good idea to think of this once in a while. So much for that. Here's something of interest I found. It's from a speech by James H. Binns, president of the Armstrong Cork Company. He said, if the United States were to equal the accomplishments of Russia, it would have to rip up 14 of every 15 miles of its paved highways, abandon 60% of its steelmaking capacity, destroy two out of every three miles of its railroads, and seven out of ten of its homes, junk 19 out of every 20 cars and trucks, and slice away three-quarters of its average paychecks. Something to think about, isn't it? And if the same definition of power...